The realization of the cell of an aluminum hypochlorite battery does not require expensive or difficult to find elements, and its realization is within everyone's reach. With this type of cell, output voltages and current densities are obtained, clearly higher than those obtained with aluminum air cells, which on the other hand suffer from major problems due to parasitic reactions, especially those that use sodium or potassium hydroxide as electrolyte. These chemical reactions led to the consumption of the aluminum electrode even when the battery is at rest. In an automotive electric battery market, currently dominated by lithium, the future could hold an opportunity for aluminum batteries. On the other hand, an aluminum ion releases three electrons, a lithium ion instead, only one. But that's another story, these are secondary, rechargeable batteries. Now we are talking about a primary battery, not rechargeable electrically. In this battery are consumed. First the sodium hypochlorite electrolyte and then the aluminum electrode. But once the electrolyte is exhausted and the aluminum has turned into oxides and hydrates, just replace these two components and the battery is working again. To build a cell of this battery, I use a beaker with 150 milliliters of 0.55% sodium hypochlorite solution. The bleach you see in the video. For the negative electrode, I use an aluminum bar. You could also use the classic roll of aluminum kitchen paper, but those thin aluminum sheets would last a short time. Using the bar, instead I know that this will last a long time, before wearing out. In the tests that follow, I used five types of positive electrodes. 1. It is an electrode formed from a piece of lead sheet. 2. Electrode cut from a copper sheet. 3. Electrode formed from a sheet of graphite. 4. Treated lead sheet. 5. Treated copper foil. And now the measurement of the no load voltage of the cell. In the beaker filled with 150 milliliters of bleach, I fixed an aluminum foil connected to the negative of the voltmeter. Now I will insert the positive electrodes to measure the voltage. The first electrode inserted is the lead electrode, measure 0.428 volts. The second electrode is the copper one, voltage 1.070 volts. The third electrode is the graphite one. One point three one one volts. The fourth electrode is the treated copper, and here I measure 1.620 volts. The highest voltage is due to the treatment that the copper has received. A thin layer of copper oxide 2, of a few microns, completely covers the electrode.
The last electrode is the treated lead one. Here the electrode has been coated with lead dioxide and here I measure 1.407 volts. At the end of the video, I will describe the treatments to which the electrodes, copper and lead, have been subjected to increase their performance. Now all that remains is to move on to the tests under load of the cell. To evaluate the validity of a battery cell, it is always necessary to test it under load and record its voltage and current trend over long times, several hours, and even days. On the screen, the measurement and recording system used on the hypochlorite aluminum cell is visible. I use a data log here to record the trend of the voltage under load and at no load. Note that I sent the cell signal to an adapter with very high input impedance, 1000 ohm, and gain 1, which I used to measure voltages from a battery with high internal resistance. In this case it would not be necessary, I could send the signal directly to the data logger, the result is the same. At the bottom right, the 5 electrodes that I will use in tests with 110 ohm load. The exposed surface of the two electrodes is 10 cm square. The electrodes are placed at a distance of 1 cm between them. And now what the cell and the measuring system for recording under load look like, first with a 100 ohm resistor, then with a 10 ohm resistor. In the beaker, on the right is visible a graphite foil with metal reinforcement, that constitutes the positive electrode. Later in another video, I will give instructions on how to build it. On the monitor the progress of the recording. The data logger has been set for a single channel, with full scale, 3 volts. The duration of the recording is 3400 seconds, or 56 minutes and 40 seconds. On the graph of the trend of the voltage as a function of time, it can be observed that the no load voltage is 1.5 volts. With a load of 100 ohms, the cell provides 12.1 mA with a voltage of 121 volts. With a load of 10 ohms, however, the cell provides 53 mA, but the voltage has dropped to 0.53 volts. This voltage drop is due to the internal resistance of the graphite electrode which is around 10 ohms. We will see that it will go better with the other electrodes, where the internal resistance is decidedly lower. Now I proceed to the tests with aluminum electrode and treated lead, immersed in 150 ml of the usual bleach solution. The lead electrode is completely coated, by a thin layer, a few microns of lead dioxide. This thin layer of oxide completely changes the electrochemical nature of the electrode, by greatly increasing the voltage of the electrode. When no load it is now 1.5 volts. The data logger has been set now for a recording length of 8500 seconds, 2 hours and 21 minutes. From the graph it can be seen that with a load of 100 ohms the cell provides 12.9 mA with a voltage of 129 volts. With 10 ohms it provides 71 mA with a voltage of 0.71 volts, performance therefore clearly superior to the aluminum graphite cell, and this is due to the low electrical resistance of the positive electrode formed by lead, lead dioxide. I have not reported here the tests done on the aluminum normal lead system because they have given results much lower than these. Now I will test the performance of the cell with aluminum electrodes and treated copper. The one that gave the best results. The copper electrode is now coated with a thin layer of oxide, black copper. The data logger was set for a recording of 8500 seconds, 2 hours and 21 minutes. At the end of the recording it can be seen in a graph that the no load voltage is 1.80 volts. With a load of 100 ohms, the current delivered to the resistance is 17.6 mA, with voltage of 1.76 volts. With a load of 10 ohms the current is 82 mA, with a voltage of 0.82 volts. Also here I have not reported the tests done on cell with copper aluminum electrodes, given the poor results obtained. 
In the graph the recording of the voltage generated by four positive electrodes, in combination with the aluminum electrode, in a solution of sodium hypochlorite 5%. In each curve three steps are identifiable. The highest corresponding to no load operation, follows the operation with a load of 100 ohms, and the lowest step, operation with 10 ohm load. The electrode that provides the highest performance is that of copper, copper oxide 2. Then with load of 10 ohms delivers 0.82 volts, with a current density of the electrodes of 8.2 mA per square centimeter. The one that provides the worst performance is the one of untreated copper. The graphite electrode is penalized here because of its internal resistance superior to other metal electrodes, but this can be improved. In a future video I will explain how to build it. Now in possession of these results the next step is to proceed with the construction of a prototype battery. In the picture the reagents necessary for the oxidation of lead and copper electrodes. The copper electrode is first greased with acetone. and then immersed in the 20% nitric acid solution, where it is completely cleaned of oxides. It is then washed first, with tap water, Then with distilled water, it is then soaked in a solution of 4.5 to 5% sodium hypochlorite, normal bleach, and then we move on to the lead electrode. Who undergoes the same treatment? and is dipped in the same glass of bleach. The electrodes remain immersed in sodium hypochlorite for 48 hours. After 48 hours of immersion in bleach, I extract the lead electrode and on its surface is clearly visible a thin film of lead dioxide with a characteristic brown color. This is a great way to oxidize lead. On the copper electrode only a few black spots of cupric oxide are visible. For the rapid oxidation of copper, another way is needed. The one described below. Two solutions must be prepared. A and B solution A consists of 50 milliliters of water with 0.7 grams of ammonium per your fate. Solution B consists of 50 milliliters of water with 3.0 grams of sodium hydrate. The two solutions should be poured into a large cup of Pyrex glass placed on top of a heating plate. The solution should be brought to a temperature between 70 and 80 degrees centigrade, better not to exceed 80 degrees. The copper electrode that after cleaning with nitric acid had remained immersed in distilled water is immersed in the cup to undergo the oxidation process. Every now and then the cup should be shaken. And the electrode must be turned. After 50 minutes the copper begins to blacken. The temperature of the solution is 80 degrees centigrade. Throughout the operation, the level of the liquid that decreases due to evaporation must be kept fairly constant, adding distilled water when necessary. 
After 1 hour and 20 minutes the copper is completely oxidized. The electrode is extracted from the oxidation bath and washed first with tap water. Then with distilled water. And put to a dry. Thank you for your attention. To the next.